So, Toya, you played the part of Monkey in Quadrophenia. Yes, I did. What, what are your memories of that time? It was just fantastic. It was so full on. Um, it was the first film I was in with my own age group. Up until that point, I'd always be the youngest person in any cast I was in. And suddenly I was with these nutcases like Gary Shale and <laughs> Phil Daniels and Mark Wingert. And it was really fantastic. It was a very, very quick learning curve on how to survive in a huge team of egos. <laughs> really nice egos, though. And what were some of those scenes like, going through the streets of Brighton and creating carnage? <laughs> Well, I, I think I was very clever because I'm um, being very small. I just kind of stayed at the front when action was called and then I disappeared to the back so that I didn't get hurt. But you were full on beating people up, weren't well, it's you? It's funny, a um, friend of mine who's here, I think, Paul asked me last night, he said, there's a scene where when we uh, uh, follow the rockers into the cafe and I'm actually the first one in. Uh, and the reason for that was because I was actually standing next to the director when he said what was going to happen next and I thought if I don't get in there quick I'm going to get crushed so that's why I leg it straight through and I just ran through the cafe out the back door um, it was it was a full-on few days I mean the thing is there was uh, there was about 20 main cast but on that day there was about 5,000 extras and we realized that if we weren't ahead of the game we were just going to be in a sea of faces so we had to be really pushy and really kind of demanding of our space otherwise we would not have been part of that whole sequence and Gary, I think it was only right, because of course you got beaten up by Red Winston, didn't you? So it was only right that you were the first one to go in there. Actually, no, I was beaten up by Gary Holton, um, who uh, is sadly no longer with us. But um, funnily enough, he also became my, one of my best mates after that. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, all, we didn't know about health and safety. I don't think we could even spell it. Um, but with the, you know, there was a few things like... Uh, we. We, uh, the director, Frank Rodden, didn't want us to wear crash helmets, but it was obviously against the law, so we never wore crash helmets, and they, so we, we were given crash helmets, um, and which we wore during the kind of rehearsal, but as soon as they said they were going to go for the tape, off came the crash helmets, and off we went. Um, and we actually had uh, quite a bad accident when we are driving down to Brighton and Chalky gets kicked off his scooter. Um, there was a, someone had parked a van around the corner and as we came around the corner some one of the stuntmen hit the van and everybody went over him and it was like carnage and they actually had to airlift him to hospital with a really badly cut leg and as we were all lying on the floor the emergency services were called uh, because obviously we didn't know just how much damage everyone had done but while we were lying on the floor going Ugh! people were running around putting crash helmets next to us so when the police turned up we weren't breaking the law so as I say we didn't you know we, we just got stuck in really I know um, Toy had actually went up and you actually whacked a real copper didn't you yeah the thing was we were in Brighton it was a bank holiday in August and we didn't know who lived in Brighton who was holiday makers because it was such a carnage that the volume of people who turned up to take part, we were told that if anyone just looked frightened and confused, that we were to move them to the side or just try and calm them down. So a lot of the times there was a lot of um, real policemen who were just trying to gain control of the situation. And then there was actors who bring their own police uniforms. So we were told that we had to ask, are you a real policeman or are you an actor before we hit them? <laughs> but, you know, by the, after the 10th hour of shooting that day, because August, there's a lot of daylight. So we, it was a long day. I ended up hitting a real policeman. <laughs> well, it must've been hard to tell them apart. I mean, you know. um, yeah, I'd say the extras looked as though they were enjoying it more. <laughs> So Toya, this next one's for you. What do you think it is about Quadrophenia? This is the 40th anniversary. It's such an iconic film. So many people love it. What do you think it is that keeps it going? I think it's a fantastic question because when this film came out, um, it was absolutely panned by the critics and it was heartbreaking. And then suddenly, new generations 
came along very quickly and discovered it and made it their film. And it's just had a kind of eternal life. It's, it's about the passage of love and growing up and finding independence. And I think it's going to go on and on and on. And I think that message will always be powerful while we are still biological creatures because you know, men fall in love, women get broody, we all fight. It's, you know, it is a universal story and it's just captured the hearts of so many people around the world. Um, I hang out with uh, the tour manager of Green Day a lot and he loves the film and they're obviously all based in LA and they can virtually recite every line from the film and that amazes me for an Americans to actually see that the film has a has a kind of cultural reference for them as well. I think the first time they showed it in America, I was in, in Los Angeles when they showed it and uh, there was a big poster up um, and that was quite thrilling. Uh, I remember the first time I saw the poster was at Hampstead Tube Station and I actually got off the train and I was just stood there thinking, that's it. That's it, I can't believe it. I'm actually on my local tube station wall. But like in America, they uh, we went to see the film and they actually had subtitled it. No. Yeah, the Americans couldn't. <laughs> hey man, what's that word, bollocks? You know, I had to explain to a lot of people how to say, it's not bollocks, it's bollocks. Um, but yeah, so yeah, uh, but the Americans do love it, as as do the Japanese. They've got their huge... I they subtitled it. I got bollocks. Very politically incorrect. Sorry for any Japanese people in the audience today. And I think you mentioned it, Gary, when I spoke to you before. Like, it kind of took off again when they re-released it on VHS and then, of course, DVD. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was working in the advertising industry in Soho and I had a recording studio and uh, no, no one um, in, in the office had, knew about Quadrophenia or that I'd even been an actor. Uh, some people still say that. Um, but, um, and I got a phone call and it was a film company and they said they were going to re-release the movie on DVD uh, and would we like to go to Brighton and have another, another um, premiere as such. And we all turned up at the station and they had a, a train, I don't think it was the 515 but I think it was a Virgin train. And we all got on the train and we were like, this is ridiculous, I mean, you know, we made this film like, you know, 15 years previously and we were like, you know, it's going to be so embarrassing when we get there and there's going to be no one there you know and we got there and it was it was ridiculous i mean we suddenly looked at each other and thought hang on a minute this little film that we thought was going to disappear has obviously got legs and that's i think when it when it had its resurgence and it's took on its a life of its own ever since and of course um, you had your event this year didn't you in brighton that went down well didn't it yeah it did um it was the most ridiculous thing i've ever done and i'll never do it again but for those of you that were at the party did you have a good time yeah yeah, yeah i was there it was great we all enjoyed it didn't we everyone goes yeah it was all right a bit expensive but uh, yeah, whatever um yeah no i enjoyed it it was a good it was a learning curve for me it's like hey why don't we put on an event uh, for any event organization uh, organizers and i include mr and mrs staple over there i i doff my hat to you believe me a lot goes into it doesn't it you don't oh, realize man it's ridiculous but um but yeah no it was good we had the weather and it was just fantastic and we did it on the pier which is what i wanted i wanted to celebrate 40th anniversary in brighton on the pier and i did it so and Toy, later on you're going to be performing some songs for us. Was that an easy progression for you, uh, from acting, going into singing? Have you always sung? Sorry, I've got the giggles at singing at 10 in the morning. Um, <laughs> you know that one, don't you? <laughs> um, was it a natural progression? Um, when I was casting Quadrophenia, which I really had to fight to get the role for, because my original... Um, participation in the movie was to get John Lydon through the screen test. So I was um, sent along by Frank Rodden to meet with John Lydon, Johnny Rotten at the time, um, teach him two scenes that we shot at Shepparton, and he was phenomenal. 
He was so good, but no one would insure the film if he was in it. And then I heard nothing else. And I was making a film at um, Lee Electrics, which is where the production office was for um, Quadrophenia. And I happened to be starring opposite Catherine Hepburn, which was big brownie marks for me and gave me a bit of kind of authority. So I went along to Frank Rodham's office and I stood outside the window because it was on the ground floor. And I remember banging on the window, shouting, give me a fucking job. And he eventually let me read with Phil Daniels and I got the part of Monkey, but he didn't intend to let me be in the film at all. So you really had to fight for it, really? Well, I had to fight for everything in my life, but, I, you know, I, I just wanted to be part of this film. There was something about it that um, Scum was being made at the time, and it was this group of actors that I really wanted to work with. So I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Yeah, it's a great cast list. And, you know, I mean, Johnny Rotten is the part of Jimmy. I mean, now it seems crazy, doesn't it, really? It doesn't really... Well, my first audition um, was with Patsy Pollock and Esther Charkham uh, down in Soho. And when I walked in, I was a punk rocker. That was my thing. Yeah, so was I. Yeah, we were like, you know, I had seditionary trousers, Vivian Westwood. I mean, I wish I'd kept that stuff, believe me. Um, and I walked in to my first audition and sat in the reception was Toya Wilcox and Johnny Rotten. And for a would-be punk rocker, it was like meeting, well, if you were a mod, it was like meeting Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey. So for me, I just took one look and I was like, I have got to be in it. If these two are going to be in it, I'm going to be in it. And I had to fight to get in it as well. So, you know, it wasn't an easy, um, we weren't just picked up off the street and we didn't, you know, as much as the Sun newspaper would like to have it believe, we all came from the street. You know, we didn't. I was at drama school, Toya had made films before. For. Phil was, had made films, uh, Phil Davis was a, a very well respected theatre actor, so um, a lot of that p publicity about we were all completely unknowns, yeah we were unknown to the general public at that point but we, we'd all been working really hard at, at being as, as good actors as we could be, so um, you know what you see on screen is a lot of hard work, but a lot of it is improvisation, which you can't do unless you're trained. And so, you know, I think it's a testament to great acting. And I think Phil Daniels did an incredible job. Um, and, you know, so, you know, when I look at that film now, it's, it's, it's like watching, you know, all that training and all that work and everything all coming together in one moment. So to see it 40 years later still being celebrated is just wonderful for all of us. I think as much as we talk about John Lydon, I think without Phil Daniels in the film, it might not have been the same film. Because he, the way he portrays it, the pain, the emotional pain, is so sincere, it's so real, it's so physical, that I think only he could have played it. And he is the heart of the film. There's a lot of vulnerability there, isn't there, in Jimmy's part? And I think it's fantastic for a man to show vulnerability, especially 40 years ago, which wasn't that kind of common. And for Leslie Ash's character to be as hard as she was wasn't that common either. So there was a beautiful kind of reversal of roles there. And it, I think that's another reason why it's such a shocking film. And also with the Who's iconic soundtrack, of course, that makes it as well, doesn't it? I think that's the heart of the whole film and if you think about it, it shouldn't really work because you've got um, a film that is supposed to be set in 1964 that was made in 1978 with a soundtrack from a, a rock and roll band uh, that were by that time one of the biggest ro heavy rock bands in the world. Um, so if you were to look at that on paper, you'd say, nah, that ain't going to work. But in fact, it, the, the opening moment of, you know, I am the sea and when as Jimmy walks back from the cliffs, it's just an iconic moment and also 5.15, I mean, you know, the list goes on. Everyone's got their favourite track on that album. But I remember listening to it for the first time and just thinking, I, this is just incredible. I mean, it's, it was just, I didn't, you know, the Who weren't on my radar. My dad had live at Leeds and every time he put it on, I was like, oh, it's not the clash, is it? You know, so, uh, but after that, you know, it, it just became a, an obsession for all of us. Um, and I still listen to that album. It's on my playlist and I listen to it at least once a week, so. Well, it's been lovely to talk to you. Let's hear it for Gary Shell and Toya. Put your hands together. <laughs> We are the boots, we are the boots, we are, we are, we are the boots.